Today on Americana Podcast, we would like to take a moment and thank all of our listeners, past, present, and future, for taking this journey with us. We realize that currently it is difficult to find comfort in these uncertain times, and having this kind of community is not only special, but grounding. Now more than ever, Americana Podcast and Keen Productions stand firm in our mission to explore and expand not only the definition, but the community of Americana music. We ask if you are able to please show support for your favorite or local artists. Whether it is purchasing albums, merchandise, or just tuning into live streams, these things can make a difference in the lives of those dedicated to their craft. Usually I send off with let the music play, but take a moment and imagine a silent world. Let's keep that music playing. Thank you. Do you ever listen to sad sounding music because it just makes you feel better? There's something naturally comforting about sad songs or sad sounding songs. Perhaps it is the ease which we as listeners can just fall into them. Or maybe it is their ability to let us explore our own emotional breadth without conscious confrontation and resistance. Or maybe it's as simple as someone else being able to capture a feeling that personally resonates with one as a listener, which for a moment feels as though we have just found a very understanding companion for a duration of four minutes or less. As author Nick Hornby states, sentimental music has a great way of taking you back somewhere at the same time it takes you forward. So you feel nostalgic and hopeful at the same time. On today's episode of Americana Podcast, we explore the timeless notion of sentimentality and hope through the music of Andrew Marlin and Emily France, professionally recognized as Mandolin Orange. Meeting in Chapel Hill, North Carolina in 2009, France and Marlin have honed the kind of sound that is both nostalgic as well as visionary. Marlin, a multi-instrumentalist as well as the primary lyricist of the duo, does not shy away from difficult topics such as estrangement, grief, and the conflict between personal ideology and geographic identity while France consistently adds the ethereal feel of Mandolin Orange's sound through either her voice, fiddle, guitar, or the golden trifecta of all three. From their debut record, Quiet Little Room, to their breakthrough, Blind Faller, and their most recent release, Golden Embers, Mandolin Orange has become a staple within the genre's context. And like their sound, their presence will remain as steadfast in Americana's past, while holding a foot in the door of its very future. So join us as our host, Robert Earl Keane, speaks with Mandolin Orange live at Railbird Music Festival about their songwriting, live show decisions, and the future of Americana music. I'm your producer, Clara Rose, and this is Americana Podcast, The 51st State. All eyes out. On the railroad, all eyes out on the sea. All these means of travel, darling, mean nothing once your soul has been set free. So hear that long, some whistle blow, and the shadow of the sail. Welcome, Emily and Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, we love this audience. We're going to do a video together pretty soon. So, Emily and Andrew, you met and played together and realized that you had a strong musical chemistry. And we want to fast forward 
to uh, when you decided to play together on stage or on a regular, semi-regular basis, was there initial proving ground, a regular gig uh, where you honed your sound? Uh, there was a, a bar that we used to spend a lot of time in um, that had a little stage that usually wasn't occupied. So we would uh, jump up there whenever they would let us. And when would that, would that be like four in the afternoon or in the evening? It'd be usually like 11.30 p.m. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, sometimes bands would be hopping off the stage and just played a set and they were like, okay, they're done early. Oh. Let's get up there and play. That's and cool. Yeah. That's cool. Did you put a, like a tip jar out or anything like that? Yeah, so. usually nothing yeah. really came about with that, but <laughs> 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 like, yeah, the tips we got were like, maybe try booking a gig next time. After uh, bonding on singing the Dylan song Boots of Spanish Leather and discovering this heartfelt musical connection, when did you decide to introduce original songs as the backbone of your duo? When did that come? I guess I was always writing, but um, we were just, you know, playing old traditional tunes. It just came so easy and naturally to us that that was what we did at first. And I think as Andrew was writing songs, we'd be working them out, and so it was just gradually working more original stuff into our what we were playing. Um, but we met at a bluegrass jam, so that was kind of our common ground for a long time and still is. Yeah, I think through that lens, too, was I started writing songs that had more of a bluegrass structure because of that, because I loved the way Emily played the fiddle on, on those old tunes, and so I would try to write songs and you know, introduce actual solo sections for her to be able to improvise over. So the songs you wrote before that had, had less space for solos or? Yeah, because I was doing a lot of finger picking and uh -huh. just singing and so I, I wasn't a very good finger picker so I didn't want to give myself a solo. So I would pretty much just arrange the songs in a way where they didn't have any sections like that. Yeah. And um, uh, back to uh, Boots of Spanish Leather, did you uh, learn that song from the same version? I don't think so. I think I learned it from, where, when we first went to play it together, I had heard it from Nancy Griffith's That's version. Yeah. And then I think, Andrew, you probably knew Bob Dylan's version. Yeah, that, his version on the times there are changing to me is just perfect. Yeah. It's so good. That's a beautiful, beautiful rendition of a really cool song. Thank you. Thanks. Or the coast of If I heard the stars of the darkest night And the diamonds from the deepest ocean well, I forsake them all for your sweet kiss For that's all I'm wishing to be on. Before you signed with Yep Rock, how did you promote uh, your first couple of records? I don't know, Emily, how did you promote our first couple of records? <laughs> oh, man. A lot of help from friends, really. I mean, there's so many musicians that live in Chapel Hill, Durham, the whole Triangle area where we're from. So I got a lot of help early on from friends that had you know, knew how to promote a club show and showed me how to make flyers and who would put them out for us. And it really was in the earlier days of social media too, so there wasn't, I mean, I think we made a Facebook page, but that maybe wasn't even until a year or two later. We had MySpace. We had MySpace. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, that was our website for like for four you? years. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, the, make the flyers you put the, the flyers out and uh, and advertise the gigs or the records the gigs uh -huh. yeah it was all about the gigs and uh -huh. then we just like slung the records at the gigs um, this side of Jordan is your first release on yep rock given the fact that you'd had a, a self-released record experience what were your where with the real record company now expectations we just didn't want to have to package them up and send them to radio stations anymore. That was that would take like weeks to do, and uh, 
So that was pretty much all we needed from them. Uh, and they did a good job with that. Um, yeah, I don't know that we had... It's, it's interesting because when you are independent for not just a little bit, but like years, you get used to micromanaging everything. And so on some level, it's kind of a challenge when you have a new partnership like that with the business to feel comfortable letting go of the control. Um, so I think it was really great going into that relationship and, and having so much more help and so many more resources, but it was also um, a, more of a gradual letting go of, of the control on our end. And uh, were there any happy surprises that came with um, working with a record company? Yeah, I think so. I think, I mean, they're, they're great at promotion and making sure they're getting our name out there and going to, you know, conferences and talking to people on our behalf. And, and it's also, what? That just sounds so vague. Oh, it is. I don't understand this world. I'm just trying to act like I know I'm what I'm talking about. You, man. Yeah. I understand. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate it. We that. really have no idea what they do. That's yeah, why. I don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, they're great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they really are, <laughs> and they're supportive and kind. I think that's what matters most to us is that, you know, they dig what they're doing, uh, what we're doing, and they are are very open to whatever we want to bring forth. And I think that's probably one of the most important parts to us. I think also a thing that's been really advantageous for us over the last several years, as streaming has become so much more important and playlisting and all that, that they've really understand that world and are pushing to be a part of that world and help us be a part of that world. And I think that's been a huge help in the last several years. Yeah, I, I found that the, particularly the independent record companies, um, they're way ahead of almost everybody on all the, like, uh, the streaming and the internet sort of uh, distribution that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's the only thing you can do if you're in that world, actually, in, yeah. in, the, in the world of, uh, like, um, Independent record sales, I guess. Night is blue as the night is long. So won't someone dance with me to a walk to that whiskey and turn sad songs to lullabies? Well, I don't need much or nothing except for all your loving. Walks about whiskey on ice. Uh, I want to talk about waltz. Waltz about whiskey, yeah. you know, which I think is a really cool country infused song. Uh, is it still included in your set rotation? Yeah, that's a that's a good closer of ours because it just yeah. It's, I mean, it's a sad song, but for some reason leaves everybody feeling good. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, I think that's definitely one that'll always be there. Yeah, yeah, really, really nice song. Can we talk about your fourth record and second record on Yep Rock, Such Jubilee? I read, Emily, that you referred to Such Jubilee as your happy record. Of course, this was from an interview about the time the record was released. Do you think of Such Jubilee in the same way today? It would probably be false to say we'd ever released a happy record. It's, re it's um, relative. Yeah, it's all relative. Sure. But I think at the time, we felt like, relatively speaking, there were some happy... What are the happy songs on that record? It's more of a celebration than happiness. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a celebration of uh, things that just aren't completely soul-wrecking. Yeah. So, yes, very happy record. Well, I, I like the uh, song um, Old Ties and Companions. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, right? a, that's uh, a happy song. Yeah, yeah. and uh, what I really like about it is it's structured in a way that it, it feels loose and relaxed, but, you know, still it's structured. And, then I, you know, some people might say, uh, you know, it's organic. And uh, I just wanted to shed some light on that, the recording of that particular song in a kind of a production way, how you thought how you thought that out, maybe? Yeah. That one was similar to like that whole record and a lot of what we do where we often kind of record the bones of it live, just the two of us, 
duo, and then we add the other things like bass or even drums if we're going to put it on after the fact, which I uh, think is somewhat unusual. But, um, but that one was the first song we recorded in that session for that album. And we went home that night, and I think Andrew didn't like sleep a wink that night because he thought it was terrible I and freaked out. awful, oh. and uh, that we weren't going to be able to make another record. And then we went back in and realized that we loved the recording, and, and that's been like a, a very long-standing, strong recording of ours, I think. Yeah, I think too. I mean, we did try to leave that one open because the progression is so simple that, especially live, you know, we can just vamp on those verses forever and, and just pass it around, you know, for solos. Right. Um, and I, you know, getting back to what I was saying earlier about trying to write songs that were more open, that, you know, uh, kind of leaned on more of a bluegrass structure. I think that one to me is one of the more successful, you know, tries of doing that. Yeah, it so sounds really great. I, and I love how it, uh, in the beginning, it's just really that acoustic guitar and then it weaves in and out with the mandolin and then the comes back in the acoustic guitar before the vocal even starts. So it's a nice, nice weaving thing going on. Yeah, know. Emily's right hand on that song sounds so cool when she slaps that low yeah. string on that guitar. <laughs> yeah. It's commanding. So last question on Such Jubilee. Uh, we heard good things about Echo Mountain Recording Studios. What are your impressions? We've recorded there a bunch. Yeah. That was our first, um, Such Jubilee was our first session there. Um, and... I mean, it's an incredible studio. I mean, there's nothing that they don't have going on there. Yeah, great engineers, great gear. Um, we've always worked with Julian Dreyer there when we worked there, and he's he's always a step ahead of you, so you don't ever have to like do the catch-up game where you're like, wait, go back. He's already just waiting for you to say that, and that I think that makes the whole process so much easier. And I think I mean, in in a lot of ways, gets the engineering out of the whole thought process of how to make the record. So, so. when you uh, book studio time there, you, you get an engineer as well? I mean, that, um, and that deals, or you bring in your own engineer if you wanted to, is that? Yeah, I think goes? you can do either way. Uh -huh. um, but we, we always worked with their house okay. engineers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and as, as I recall, I looked it up not too long ago, but it's, it's visually impressive, is that right? Yeah, yeah. they have multiple buildings um, beside each other and the one that I think is most iconic that that people think of when they think of Echo Mountain is an old church, mm -hmm. and it still has all the stained glass windows and super high ceilings, and it sounds really good. But then they have a whole separate building that's an API studio with an API board and actually has a big room there, too. It's just not quite as visually um, impressive, maybe, as the church, but they have a ton of options. just enough to keep these ghosts around those haunted fields mm. but old ties and companions you and I we're just passing through But after uh, such jubilee, I guess uh, you returned to your old haunt, the Rubber Room Studio, yeah. for what uh, many might say was your breakthrough record, Blind Faller, right? So why, why return at that point? I think at that point we had been on the road so much, and we were also wanting to try out you know, recording with the band. And, um, and so with that, we wanted to stick close to home, make sure we had enough time to you know, relax and really approach the songs. Um, with the band in a way that wasn't feeling rushed or feeling like we were just throwing drums over our duo. You know, it's, um, we wanted to get the right folks and, yeah, and take our time with it. And so I think the Rubber Room was a good place to do that because um, I've worked in that room a bunch and I know Jerry really well, the, the engineer there. He's taught me a bunch. And so, yeah, just I think it brought it back down to a very uh, home-feeling, personal approach. Emily, you sing a compelling lead on Hey Stranger. How do you all decide who sings what? There's not that great of a method to it. It's, I mean, most of them by default go to Andrew. Um, but 
usually just from the beginning there'll be a song that feels right for my register or some I don't I don't have a really amazing range and so a lot of songs if if the range of the melody is really broad then it's a much better fit for Andrew um I don't really know sometimes we go back and forth but usually we'll just sort of I'll sing it once and then we'll just keep it that way she's picky <laughs> that makes it easier. Right? That makes it easier, yeah. I'm just like, okay, I'll sing it. Yeah. So do you ever write specifically from a woman's point of view? Um, yeah, sometimes. Um, I think uh, there's one, There Was a Time, which is one that Emily sings. Uh, definitely a buddy of mine got divorced, and I, for some reason, wrote a song from his ex-wife's perspective. It's, it's like a... That's what you do for your friends. Um, and, but that, I think, you know, back to the other question, too, that was one that Emily heard for the first time and was like, I think I want to sing that song. So. I just wanted to sing that one because it's catchy and yeah. selfish. Yeah. Hey, stranger, it's danger down the line. You'll find heartache and trouble and all your good times. The song Wildfire is strong musically and emotionally. Uh, I'm unsure about the storyline, but I understand the story. Uh, is Wildfire a staple in your live shows? Yeah, I definitely think that's probably one of our catchier tunes and most well-known tunes. Yeah, I think it's one people really like to hear. And it's, it's a really simple song that is just easy. It's three chords the whole way through, and the, the groove just, you set it and forget it. Kind of, and um, and it's I think because it's so simple, it's not one that we really get tired of playing either. It's it's a powerful message and it's musically fun to play, and so um, we do pretty much play that one every night. In your in the world of building set lists, are are you holding on to pretty much the same set night after night, or you you swap it around? Structurally, we keep a lot of similarities. Like we'll have certain songs we like to start with, certain songs we like to end with, but we do try and, I mean, there's so much back catalog at this point that we try to mix in different older songs every night, I guess for the crowd, but also just for our own sakes, you know? Yeah. So we don't get too robotic. <laughs> yeah, we all love the solo over the songs, and I think changing up the songs Every night gives us a little, that pulls us out of ourselves and makes us have to kind of improvise a little more than we would if we were just doing the same song every night. Right. So uh, what did B Blind Fowler bring to you in the way of attention? I mean, it, uh, like I say, I read, I read that it was somewhat a breakthrough record. What, what was the difference? It's hard to say. I mean, I think a, a lot of those songs we recorded um, with the band and we didn't, we, we played them super live in the studio, and so the arrangements and I think the, the end result with that was just songs that were really relatable. And um, I think a lot of the subject matter on that record, too, is, is a bit more like outward facing. It's not as um, internal. And so it seems like people just really gravitated to, to those recordings and, and those songs specifically. Yeah, I think doing it with the band too, like you were just saying, um, because we did it all live, it, it just, those songs translated on the stage that much easier, you know, because it just felt like we weren't trying to recreate something that we somehow pulled off in the studio. We were actually just going to do what naturally came in the studio. So like you said before, the bones were there in the studio and that, that's really what you stick with on stage, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. right. 
Uh, so uh, how many times have you been asked the meaning of blind faller? <laughs> a few times, yeah. Um, More times than we've been able to answer it well. <laughs> yeah, I think, but you came up with the name, right? It was just a conjunction that, uh, well, faller is like in a logging operation, the person who's in charge of felling the trees. And, uh, and so we like the, the idea, because there's a lot of tree imagery on that record. And a they, lot of destructive, yeah, a lot of destruction societal well. destruction going on in the songs as well. So um, felt like an appropriate. No, it's a, it's a really great title. Thank I, you. I love the title. No uh, one's but, ever said that actually. But I love the title, but uh, also when I looked it up, it just keeps coming back mandolin orange over yeah. and over. It yeah. says, you know, and I had to dig deeper to find out what it really meant. Yeah. Yeah. Emily came up with that. She's modern day Shakespeare there. She's inventing <laughs> words. A, a, a new, a new album title in the works, right? Modern mm. day Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? I'll write that one Your tomorrow. Next EP. <laughs> You'll probably beat me to it though. I bet you can get that one, get that one on pen and paper. I'm writing it down right now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I see you over there. You better. Yes, sir. I was born a southern son in a small southern town where the rebels run wild. They beat their chest and they swear we're going to rise again. And it should have been different. It could have been easy the day that old horn died. Hate should have gone with it. But here we are, caught in the wild. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with our interview with Mandolin Orange shortly. At Americana Podcast, it is our goal to define and explore Americana music in its full context. With help from our guide with his ear to the ground, Will Vote, this is Will's pick. Better As I Go by Rick Scott, from the EP Nowhere Near Done. Born in North Carolina, the son of a country singer, Ray Scott was well-versed in traditional country when he first came to Nashville in the late 1990s. His songs reflected the influences of Christofferson and Waylon Jennings, were initially well received. By 2005, he had a record deal and was writing songs including Pray for the Fish, which was covered by Randy Travis. Over the next 15 years, he continued to release albums and tour and write, and had a satellite radio hit with Those Jeans in 2011. In 2014, a near-fatal car accident encouraged him to give up drinking, and his work from this time reflects his wake-up call. This month, he has released an aptly named EP, Nowhere Near Done. The six tracks on this disc showcase Scott's writing skills and his distinctive baritone. There also seems to be a new maturity and sense of urgency within the songs. The standout on this EP is Better As I Go, a beautiful modern take on traditional country music, which is welcome to all listeners of the genre. There's a reason Let's go ahead and talk about your newest record, Tides of a Teardrop, and it was re released in, I'm going to get this right, February 2019? Yeah, yes. you yes, got sir. it. Uh, given that y'all uh, are standing on an impressive body of work, how do you approach crafting a set these days? Back to the set list question. Uh, what songs uh, from the new record are fan favorites? Which ones have you found really work? Um, off that record, definitely the first two Golden Embers and the Wolves are two that just, they're so fun to play live. You know, I think the structure of it and the melodies of it and just how, it, you know, the feel of them, I think really translates live. Yeah. Um, and then also, 
like Time We Made Time is another one that is structurally a bit, or sonically a bit different. And, and that's one we've been able to do live and it always feels like a sort of a breath in the set that is, is different from everything else that's going on. So that's been fun. But it is hard, the more records we put out, the, the harder it is to make a set list because you know there are folks that want to hear some of the old stuff and we still enjoy playing a lot of those songs, but um, at least for a period of time after the album comes out, you feel like you have to be playing majority new material. Um, but it, it's, it's been fun it's to you know, force ourselves out of the set lists that we were playing up until that point. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, now that the the album cycle is kind of winding down a little bit, we're able to make set lists that don't have to include every song off the new record. And we're finding ones that we're more comfortable with just letting them be album songs and ones that I think will always be in the set list. So, Andrew, you tackle your mother's passing on this record. Was that your intention from the outset? Yeah, it was... I didn't know if I was going to make a record with it, you know, if we were going to get a whole record of worth of songs, but there was one night where I was just staying up way too late and you know, just the the weight of it was just just sitting really heavy with me. And so I decided to, instead of kind of beating around it in a song and, and having little snippets work its way into a song, to just hit it straight on. And uh, with that in mind, I wrote Late September. and. Yeah, it's one of the heavier ones on the record, and uh, um, it it was very healing, and it felt great. And so the next time I sat down to write a song, I, you know, kind of shut my eyes and tried to, you know, clear myself away from the rest of the world and, you know, think about how I was actually feeling in that moment and what I could get out, and kind of did that for almost every song on the record. It takes a lot of courage just to stand up on stage. I, I think some people don't understand that, but just being out there in front of people, it takes a lot of courage. And, but I want to know where do you go in your head and in your heart to control the emotional backlash that can occur during a performance of these heartbreakingly intense songs? I go to a dark place sometimes. Um, but it, it does, like I said, it, it's almost like therapy. You know, it's, it's like... Um, admitting these feelings and getting them out into the world in a lot of ways makes it, it just makes me realize what's actually going on internally and and does heal those wounds and makes them i think in throwing them out there I, I don't feel like i'm the only one holding on to it and you know it sparks conversations with with people in the crowd that have lost people and heard coming to these songs uh, for that reason and it's almost like building a community of of people that know exactly how i feel and that that has done a lot for me. That's been one of the coolest things to hear back from people who are listening to the new album. Um, just people seem to be really appreciative of the songs because the longer you live, you know, I think the more people, the more likely you are to have lost someone important to you. And so it's, it's something that so many people are experiencing. And I think it's an outlet to listen to those songs or sing them in your car or watch someone perform them. That's an outlet for other folks too, just the way it is for Andrew. So um, I think a lot of people have connected to it on a really personal level. So when you're up there singing, um, are you musically united uh, when he's sing singing, when Andrew's singing these intensely personal songs? Is that is that where you feel comfortable in that way? It's just playing the music? Yeah, I guess I'm not always, maybe maybe I am able to compartmentalize it more than he is, uh -huh. possibly, um, and just think more about the musical role that I have to play on stage. Um, I, don't, I don't know what goes on in your head. I can't answer that one for you. <laughs> Sing this 
Pharaoh spread their mortal wings. But now they've all lighted with the silence of strings, like notes on the pages. She breathed life into all things. If you could help me to share the trouble that you've got burning in you, then you can help me. And in our time together, her memory will ever shine. going to go to the lighter side. Uh, what are a couple of your favorite covers to, that you've done? Mm. Oh, man. Well, we talked earlier about Boots of Spanish Leather. That's a favorite, but it's one we really, it, you know, it's a really long song, and it's one that people request super often, so for that reason, we don't play it super often. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we reserve it so we don't get tired of it, but it makes it really satisfying to play when we do. Yeah, I think uh, one of my favorites is Emily Sings Cowgirl in the Sand by Neil Young. And I love the perspective switch there when, when she sings that song as opposed to when a, when a dude sings that song. And um, I think that's probably one of my favorite covers. It's, it's great to solo over and, you know, Emily's, Emily's range is kind of right there with Neil Young. Yeah, it's interesting which... We, I mean, I think we play less and less covers, I mean, we rarely even have one in the set at all, but there are the handful of tunes that we've been playing since the very beginning. Pretty much Cowgirl in the Sand has always been around, Boots of Spanish Leather. Uh, there's an Emmy Lou Harris song that we love called Easy From Now On um, that makes its way into the set whenever Clint, our bass player, can convince us to do it. Yeah, I think that's why he joined the band, actually, just to <laughs> play that song with Emily. What are your favorite guilty pleasure songs? I'm not talking about songs that you play, but songs that you like, that, you know, you wouldn't want to, you know... Mine would be a Roy Orbison song, so... Uh, <laughs> you know. Well, it might be one that we play, because we've been known just every now and then to cover uh, Strawberry Wine. Ah, yeah. yeah. Great tune. Yeah, it's a great... I know, I know the person who wrote that. She's a great writer. Yeah, it's a great She's song. Yeah, it's, yeah, a, good it's a great, great song. Yeah. And actually, to hear her version is really even cooler. Kind yeah. Of, you know, it's really great. Yeah. Um, I think for me, right now, have you listened to any Maggie Rogers stuff? Mm, no. It's, man, it's... I, that's not guilty, though. Light on? It's guilty for me. I, I mean, I like to keep my facade of just like a serious mandolin player, but I, I, I dance like a little kid when I, that song comes on. <laughs> uh, what is your most maddening earworm song? Have you heard Maggie Rogers yet? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. There's just one song. No. Um, it is an earworm, but... Uh. Usually, whichever song Andrew wrote most recently is hey, thanks. an earworm for me. That's because you have to hear it over and over. Um, I, for me, what's that one tune you sing sometimes, Neil Young? It's the, uh, used to work in a diner. Oh, Unknown Legend. Man, that one, like, I find myself yeah. singing that one constantly. Yeah. Something about that melody is it's very simple, but it, it's effective. So, yeah, I'd say that one for sure. All right, here's my DIY question. If you could wallpaper your favorite room with set lists from your favorite artist, what artist would you choose? Oh, wow. I mean, probably Gillian and Dave, I would say. Yeah, Gillian Welch. Probably Neil Young. Yeah. I mean, how does he decide what to play every night? Yeah, no kidding. People just shout his soul set lists out to him, I guess. Yeah. Know, right? right. Um, Dale McCurry band. Uh, I, I, can, Dale I can McCurry. always listen to the Dale McCurry band. So. Uh, on the wind, the wolves are howling. Open arms are closed in fear. Helping hands are clenched in aim. 
broken hearts beyond repair Everything so great can't get better Makes me want to cry But I'll go out help at the moon Uh, here at Americana Podcast at 50 First State, our goal is to define, explore, and expand the definition of Americana music. Emily and Andrew of Mandolin Orange has become an integral part of the genre. My question is, do you identify yourselves with Americana? I mean, I, I think so, because I guess we all don't, we all talk about that a lot and don't know what Americana means exactly, but... I think of it as music that is any sort of mashup of like country, folk, stringed instrument music, and that's what we do. Yeah, mm -hmm. self-generated. Yeah. Perhaps yeah. Yeah, I yeah. didn't think about it, that aspect of it, but definitely. Yeah. Well, we're collecting all of this, so we we will find a definitive. Okay. answer to this and I'll write you a letter that would be yeah. useful to us <laughs> because we get asked about what it is a lot <laughs> I think yeah one of the coolest things is that it's not defined and I think it it's an open genre and a lot of people can come at it from many different angles and that's one of the greatest things about Americana let's say you're at a cocktail party and you don't know anyone someone asks you what you do and you say you play music then they ask you, what kind of music do you play? Normally, what is your answer? I say cosmic folk music. Yeah? Yeah. I say folky singer-songwriter. Mine's way better. Country, bluegrass, old time. You're, you're covering Americana. It. You're going to cover it all. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually They're going to the like you no matter what. Right? Yeah. They usually take a sip of their drink then and say, good luck, and walk <laughs> off. Yeah. No, I actually, I think the best descriptor that you came up with is songwriter picking music because it's everything we do is, is very songwriter oriented, but then we're also love to play bluegrass and a big part of what we do on our records and especially at our live show is, is try to showcase our instrumental playing as well. So it feels like kind of a mashup of that Americana side of things, but also um, shining a light on the picking side of things. If you were the boss, the jefe, the tribal leader, the sandbox queen or king of Americana genre, what would you like to see embraced? I don't know, I feel like so much is already embraced. Um, maybe. Oh, so think? the question was, what would what would we like to see embraced? Yeah, what in, would you like to see embraced in Americana music? And, and you know, what the, that's the big, broad world of Americana. What would you like to see embraced? It could be a type of music. It could be, uh, you know, uniforms. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, if anything, I mean, the thing that a lot of us think about a lot that is already happening but is embracing more underrepresented voices and uh -huh. people of color and who have been playing music that you don't, I think on the surface a lot of people don't think about like old time and folk music and think about people of color and the history that that has in this country but I think there are a lot of folks who haven't gotten their due um, in the spotlight and um, I think there's a lot of attention that could be paid to that. Have you ever, uh, have you ever uh, um, heard some artists on Malico Records out of Mississippi? I don't think so. Yeah, you would like it. Yeah. yeah cool. it, 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 well, I don't think they consider themselves Americana either, but it's it's what you're talking about. It's really yeah. really cool, really cool stuff. So. We punish our souls for being unclean and bask in the glory of living obscene. Friends is a friend, and our friends build the memories we sacrifice for the song. Oh, it's maddening, running to the feast, hiding from the monsters in the belly of the beast. Just give me your love, that's all I need. Hide me from the monsters in the belly of the um, so, we want to move on to the uh, lightning round. There are no wrong answers here. It's uh, either or, or and uh, there's one multiple choice, okay? okay. 
All right. Bourbon or one of a thousand inferior distilled spirits? <laughs> uh, I would, I'd say one of a thousand. Yeah. I'm, Me too. I like tequila. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Uh, Asheville or Nashville? Asheville. Yeah, I'd take Asheville. Mountains or the coast? I'm going to the beach on Monday, so going to go with coast right now. I always thought I was a mountain man, but I do love the beach. So, yeah, the coast. Thomas Wolf or Wolf Blitzer? <laughs> Thomas Wolf. Thomas Wolf. <laughs> there we go. Upper Northeastern North Carolina or Mid Southwestern North Carolina? I got this from watching weather on, in North Carolina. I like that. Uh, well, uh, Andrew's from Northeastern. Yeah, North upper Carolina. Northeastern, just because I understand those folks. So. Okay. Uh, devil Eggs or Devil's Dream? What was the second? Deviled Eggs or Devil's Dream? I don't like the song Devil's Dream, and I love a deviled egg, so I'll go with devil, <laughs> Devil's Egg. Yeah, I'll go with the eggs. You're the fiddle player. I know. That's why I'm going with the eggs. Okay. <laughs> Black Mountain Rag or Ragtime Annie? Black Mountain Rag, especially Doc's version. Yeah. I think there might be a cooler version of Ragtime Annie than the one I learned when I was learning fiddle tunes, so I'm not... The Byron Berlin version yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. It's outstanding. But I like both of them. So. Yeah. And there are you no wrong answers it. here. I'll choose Ragtime Annie because that's the one that I learned as a young fiddler. Sounds good. We'll have to do a mashup sometime on stage. Claw hammer banjo or scrug style banjo? Man, it really depends. Um, Probably claw hammer if we're speaking about in the context of our music. Yeah, yeah, claw hammer. Yeah. But Scruggs style is deeply admired as well. Stephen Foster or Bananas Foster? <laughs> I love Bananas. Bananas Foster's for me. <laughs> yeah, I'll go with the bananas. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the edibles. Uh, this is a giveaway. F style mandolin or A style mandolin? You know, I've had some good A style mandolins, but, but yeah, F style mandolin. It matters. It does. Yeah, well, you're the one with the Lloyd Lore, so I uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's the multiple choice question. You ready? Legendary country music singer and songwriter, the sad poet from Shelby, North Carolina, was A, Orville Gibson, B, Henry Gibson, C, Mel Gibson, D, Don Gibson, E, Gibson, Les Paul. Oh, shit. I think it was. I think... What, say the first couple again? Orville Gibson, Henry Gibson, Mel Gibson, Don Gibson, Gibson, I Les think, Paul. I think it was Don Gibson was from show. Ta-da! Bing, 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 bing. Hey, clap. Come on. Yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last question here. Uh, here at Americana Podcast, the 51st State, we feel it is our duty to scour the earth in search of a new name for the instrument that has been relegated to a name that is better suited for military equipment or bowling shoe cubbies. We're talking about the organ known as the B3. Mm. Do you have a new name for the B3? Leslie's husband? I don't know. If it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll go with that. <laughs> I, like, I like that. I like that. Uh, Emily Andrew, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us, Robert. Appreciate it. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank all, thanks all for joining us on the grounds of the Railbird Festival in Verdant and Vibrant Keeneland, Kentucky. I'm your host, Robert Earl Keene. time, we would like to thank our host, Robert Earl Keane, Railbird Music Festival, Richland Group, and our guests, Mandolin Orange. Americana Podcast is brought to you by Keane Productions, edited and produced by Clara Rose, with original music by Kim Warner. Until next time, keep the music playing.